Leah Mills first stepped onto the stage of activism in 2009 when she was 12 years old. After a short video of her presenting a speech went viral on YouTube with over a million views, she was thrust into public speaking. Leah was forced to change her last name to protect herself and her family after receiving thousands of negative comments, including various degrees of insults, declarations that she should have been aborted or raped, and a slew of death threats. By 2011, the fervor died down, but Leah realized she was more passionate about seeing an end to abortion and euthanasia than she had originally thought. She found she could no longer ignore the injustices Take, taking place around her, so she has continued fighting for human rights, specifically as related to the issues of abortion, human trafficking, and euthanasia. Leah has produced over 30 videos on social justice issues and has been featured in a number of TV shows, radio broadcasts, and magazine articles, and has also contributed to LifeSite News. Young, fiery, and passionate, Leah seeks to be informative and inspirational all while conveying the truth and love. Please join me in welcoming my dear friend, our keynote speaker, all the way from Toronto, Canada, Leah Mills. I believe in truth, justice, and equality. I believe that with great freedom comes great responsibility. I believe that anyone can change a nation, and that is why I fight. As you already know, I am Leah Mills, and I am honored to be with you here today. I have spoken at many events such as these, and I often look into the crowd, and I am forever humbled and moved by the perseverance and dedication that I see in your eyes. Someone once called me, many people have actually called me, the face of the pro-life movement, and I have to say that I disagree. You here today, you are the face of the pro-life movement. You are courageous, bold, and loyal to your beliefs. You are hardworking, educated, and passionate about your cause. You have a fire burning within you that rain cannot put out, no matter how strong it may fall, or no matter how windy it may be. You are the face of the pro-life movement, and I'm just one young woman who came from Canada today to join you. In my travels, I often look out into the crowd, and I see eyes that have known pain, sadness, and injustice. I know eyes that have become bitter because of persecution and have often wept and been brought to tears because of past sights. I often look out and I see eyes that are searching for a light in the darkness, a glimmer of love in a sea of fear, a fire of hope in a forest of hopelessness. And these eyes often plead with me and say, Leah, why do I fight? Remind me why I took on this lifelong battle. And it may be true that I'm only one among thousands, and it's true that I am young, but I know this, God can use anyone. My God is a God of truth, love, and justice. My God uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. My God does not look for the qualified, he looks for the willing. Through the word of God, I know that his grace is sufficient for me, for his power is made perfect in my weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. One of my favorite quotes of all time says, we the willing, led by the unknowing, are doing the impossible for the ungrateful. We have now done so much with so little for so long that we are qualified to do anything with nothing. Mother Teresa said those powerful words, and let me tell you today that God has qualified each and every one of us to do everything and anything with nothing. He is a miracle-working God today, and I stand here alive and well because of the miracles that he has worked in and through my life. 
I want to expand a, a little more on the video that you just saw because I want you to understand one, one very important thing about myself. I am no one special. I'm just some 17-year-old girl. My name's Leah. I came from Toronto. I live in a town of about 5,000. And I like to read, write, and paint. I'm no one special. Then why am I here? Because I serve a God who is very, very special. As the video said, I was 12 years old when I first heard the voice of God calling me to speak about the issue of abortion. I was in grade seven at the time, and I went to one of thousands of public schools in Ontario and was one of thousands of students that had to write a speech. The only difference between me and every other student was that I decided to ask God about what topic I should do. And the funny thing is that it wasn't even for a specific reason. I just didn't know what topic to do, and I decided to ask him. But God took these ordinary circumstances and decided to do something extraordinary. The first thing he did was to point me towards the topic of abortion. I was very unknowledgeable in regards to the issue at that age, obviously. Uh, and it kind of it gives a bigger understanding of the verse when it says, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. My first problem came when I tried to finalize my topic with my teacher because she was pro-abortion and she said that she felt the topic was too big, too mature, and too controversial. Be there was a contest, as the video said, there was a contest that was attached to the project and she said that I would be automatically disqualified if I chose the topic of abortion. After many tears and many, many prayers, I decided that I would persevere and I chose to follow what God was calling me to. As was stated, everyone tried to change my mind, my teacher, my school librarian, my parents even, but I held firm and God gave me the strength that I needed to respectfully decline the suggestions that were given by other adults. The first miracle in this story, what the video doesn't say, the first miracle is that my teacher, after I presented my speech in front of my class, my teacher actually had a change of heart and became my biggest supporter. God, God softened her heart and what she actually did is there was a class vote as to who should go into the contest and she overrode the decision that had originally been made. And I was disqualified and requalified and disqualified and requalified over and over again and there was a judge that actually stepped down and refused to hear what I had to say. But God, over and over and over again, showed me that he partners with those who walk in alignment with his kingdom. And he supports those who fight for him and for his kingdom. And as a 12-year-old, that was a sign to me that God was on my side, and it helped me know that I was doing what was right. My beautiful mother decided that she wanted to videotape my speech and post it on YouTube. Looking back, my parents and I realized that there was so much spiritual warfare to get that video done. I mean, everything went wrong. Anything and everything you can think of. Like Mother Teresa said, we were unqualified and we were tasked with the impossible. We almost gave up because from our perspective, this video was just for a few friends. It was seemingly unimportant. But God had bigger plans, evidently, and he gave us the strength and motivation to um, pu push on and complete the task. We finally uploaded the video onto YouTube. It was a glorious day in Canada, and God immediately began to do incredible works. The videos, the views skyrocketed from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 to 500,000. And right now at the moment, including all the other reposts in different languages and um, different people translating it, there have now been over 1.5 million views that have seen that original video. We began to experience even more spiritual warfare, as the video says, as the comments began to roll in. Um, there were many very positive, encouraging comments, people saying that I, it was amazing that I was standing up for what I believed in. But there were a lot of comments that, that stated that people wished I was aborted and people wished that I was raped, sometimes specifically specifying that they hoped my dad raped me. Or There were a lot of death threats that we got. And our church leaders actually were counseling my parents to take the video down because they said that they were putting my life in danger. 
and we, for a short time, we did take the video, um, we put it on a different uh, setting so that it was privatized and no one could see it. But God knew what he was doing. Praise God, he is omniscient, knowing all things, and he sees the bigger picture when we just see a tiny little image from a foggy little window. After receiving a call from Lou Engel, who's actually a, an evangelist and a very pro-life pastor who travels the United States, uh, we prayed about the video and we felt like we were meant to make it public once more. So God proved again and again that he was with me and he showered favor upon me. And as the video says, that there were, there were thousands of requests for speaking engagements, for copies of the video from all across the world, from Finland and England and Australia and Malta is using it in their school system. And in the first year alone, I traveled to the United States to, to get a video that, uh, not a video, sorry, to get a, an award that I had been nominated that I didn't even know what, what it was. Um, and I, I spoke a number of different speaking engagements and I spoke in front of 12,000 at the March for Life in Canada in, um, in Ottawa, which is our capital city. So since then, I have continued fighting over the last five years for my ultimate goal. Now, contrary to what many, many people believe, my ultimate goal is not actually to make abortion illegal because what are the use of laws if they don't come out of foundational truths that are believed by a society? I do want abortion to be made illegal, don't get me wrong, I think laws are, are proper and just and I do want to see abortion prohibited in our nation, in my nation as well as yours. But I don't want that to be my ultimate goal, I want that to be a repercussion of my main focus and my main focus is to see abortion made unthinkable. I want to call nations back to truth, life and justice. And to do this, one must first seek and find the source of all things, which is the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I have radically pursued God and followed him wherever he leads. And for his name, I have made 30 videos, even though I don't like making videos. And I have spoken and traveled and, and I have, I have expanded my topics to include uh, not only abortion but also euthanasia and human trafficking and God has also actually called me to write a book uh, I don't know how to do that very well but God is teaching me and I do that in between school and, and my pro-life activism and I've been invited to speak across across international borders I've spoken in front of thousands and my message has reached millions and all of this came out of one 12 year old girl making one simple choice because God chose to share his heart with her and that changed her life. It really, really is like what Mother Teresa said, which we the willing are led by the unknowing, are doing the impossible for the ungrateful. We have now done so much with so little for so long, we are qualified to do anything with nothing. God truly, truly uses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. Amen? Now, I believe that one of the most important things that pro-lifers can do to further the pro-life movement is to stay connected. Unity is from God, therefore disunity and isolation is of the devil. That is why I, I have a table back there and I've done everything I can for you guys to stay connected with me and for me to stay connected with, with you as fellow pro-lifers and as brothers and sisters in Christ. So I have a newsletter that I send out just giving updates about what I do. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter and all those social media things. Um, and I've actually created art prints because I love art. And uh, if you choose to support me, I, I would appreciate it. And I have so many dreams that God has put on my heart and, and any way that you can support me, particularly in prayer, is much, much appreciated. Now, one thing I've had to come to terms with is the fact that my life is not my own. I chose to lay down my life for my king, and I make that decision and remake that decision every day of my life. And let me tell you that that's the best choice I've ever made, and it's, not, it's one that I've never, ever regretted. I'm so incredibly thankful for the opportunities that God has given me, and I'm extremely excited for my chance to share my heart with you today. God has revealed a lot of things to me over the past five years, and, and I'm really honored to be able to take his wisdom and give it to you today. So truth in love and love in truth. That is what I wish to share with you today. 
Truth and love are the two most important things that we as Christians can give to the earth. In the Bible, which is the written word of God, Jesus says that he came to testify to the truth. For a long time I had the flawed assumption that Jesus came for salvation, or specifically for redemption, or maybe specifically for nations. But no, Jesus says the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Truth is a powerful tool, so powerful that the Son of God came to testify and bear witness to it. Truth can set captives free. And as all of us here know, truth can set a country free that is held captive by death, by the culture of death. For this reason, I have dedicated my life to sharing truth with as many people as will listen to my message. But truth isn't the only thing that's key in God's kingdom. The word of God in 1 John 4 verse 8 declares that God is love. I was praying one day on my couch up in Canada and God showed me something and the Bible says a lot about love and, and the many uses of love. And God showed me that if we want our work to be blessed, if we want to have God backing us up, which is something that hopefully we all want, then we need to walk in unconditional love. Then and only then will be we wa will be we will we be walking in alignment with God's kingdom. Love is a powerful tool that can unlock hardened hearts and open doors of deliverance. Now I've found that those who are involved in the pro-life movement, myself included, are often in this frustrating dilemma of trying to show love but also feeling the urgent need to speak the truth. What I want to do today is to share with you what I've found and what I've been taught about balancing the two concepts, about showing truth in love. And some of you might be thinking, but Leah, you don't understand. Like, let's get practical here. There, there are babies that are dying. Have you seen what's happening out there? There's, there's no time for this loving stuff. We just have to speak the truth. And to that, I would just, I would say one thing. The Bible says that there's a time for everything. It says that there's a time to speak and a time to be silent. And that's something that I don't always understand because I'm a very talkative person. But to find the perfect balance between truth and love, we must be aware, specifically in the pro-life issue, we must be aware of what time it is, what God is saying about this moment. And I believe that there is no such thing as a one method fits all in the pro-life movement because of two specific extremes. Now the first situation is as follows. You're trying to talk to a post-abortive woman, and you're ex trying to explain to her why she needs to repent and seek forgiveness. Now, perhaps we all have good intentions, you know, maybe not all of us has been, have been there, but I've been there, and we, we have good intentions, but sometimes saying, you know, the unborn are human, and explaining all the scientific facts, and saying, well, women who have abortions are murderers, and, and they should go to jail, sometimes that's not the way that we're supposed to go about it. Sometimes all that achieves is making that woman shut down or get angry or feel shamed. Now, that is obviously wasn't the intention, but that's kind of the, the result of the method that's, I will always speak the truth, always, 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 and kind of forget about everything else. Now, the other extreme, which I know is also very important, is, is this. You meet a pro-abortion advocate who says that they support all abortions for any reasons at any time no restrictions. Not wanting to offend them, you just smile and nod at all the right moments and, you know, let them go on their way. And what is the result? Well, they spend the rest of their lives believing a lie, and your stance as a pro-lifer wasn't properly conveyed. And so I think that um, these are kind of the two extremes, and obviously most cases happen in the middle. But in, res in response to, my, to the first case, where truth is you know, sometimes released like a, a lion that just kind of destroys everything, this is what I say. Pro-lifers have access to a secret weapon, which often pro-abortion advocates don't have access to. With it, we can make walls crumble, open up minds, and find favor in the driest places. Our secret weapon is called love. If we were to love every single pro-abortion advocate, despite our obvious differences, despite what they say, regardless of how they might treat us, doors would open for us and we could usher in the change that we so desperately seek. Now for the other situation, the person who's trapped in the I don't want to offend anyone mentality, I say this. 
The fact that someone may take offense at what I say does not justify my silence. I'm Canadian. I'm by nature the, the type of person who just wants to make everyone happy. In the past, I would have been described as a people pleaser. But one thing that I've learned, one thing that the abortion debate has taught me for sure, is that you can never, ever make everyone happy. Even if you choose to be silent and not say anything, you will offend someone with your silence. Even if you try to stay out of the line of fire, you will offend someone. So we must remember this. The fact that people may be offended by what we say does not excuse us not speaking the truth. If we speak the truth in love, not desiring to purposely offend anyone, then we have done everything that we have been called to do. But you can never justif justify silence by saying you didn't want to offend someone. So what is the solution here? We have these two extremes. What's the solution? Well, I believe that we must apply the wisdom of Solomon, who, who said that we had to be aware of what time it is. Is it time to speak or is it time to be silent? Is it time for peace or is it time for war? And our job really is very, very simple. All we have to do is let God do the leading, follow him, and, and be aware of what situation it is and what he's asking us to do. Now, I think often, I just want to briefly touch on this, sometimes as pro-lifers, sometimes we feel like we're the victims. I mean, people, you know, people are, are always yelling at us. People, sometimes, Jake mentioned someone, some, sometimes people shoot at them. People, I've heard of people being hit by cars, and sometimes we feel like we're victims. But I want to remind you today that you are powerful. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors. The Bible says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, not some things. So time and time again, the, the Bible talks about our identity and says that we are powerful. We have been chosen by God, and we are, we are meant to rule the nations. Now, two tools, I just want to finish off with this, two tools that we cannot be without in this battle for life. The first one is honor. A very prominent Christian leader who, who's up in, in Canada, she pointed out that the sexual revolution in the 60s started in part by a generation that became blatantly disrespectful and dishonoring, particularly towards authority figures in the nation and parents. In some ways, they had a very good reason for their rebellion, yet they chose to use the wrong tool and they laid a foundation for destruction for both their generation and generations to follow. We cannot afford to take up those tools of disrespect and dishonor towards authority or towards anyone. God makes it clear in the sixth commandment that honoring our parents and by extent honoring other authorities will cause us to live long in the land that God has given us. Now what's the opposite of living long? Well, premature death, abortion. There's a biblical principle that says that honor gives life and dishonor brings death. Now, if we want to see the end to abortion, which I know we all want because that's why we're here, then we must stop fueling the spirit of death. Whether you are from my generation, who, who kind of continues this by dishonor and rebellion, um, rebelling against authority figures and parents, or whether you're of the generation that, that brought in this originally, this spirit of dishonor, we can all be part of the solution through repentance and commitment to honor as much as we can all the time. Now the second tool is hope. Well, those of us who, who still have a fighting spirit in us, sometimes we, you know, lean towards dishonor. On the other end of the spectrum, there are those who, who maybe this is your struggle, hopelessness. I've only been involved in the pro-life movement for five years, and for me, that's like, like a quarter of my lifetime. I mean, it's a long time, but for some of you, you've been here fighting against abortion since since the, the Roe v. Wade overturned the abortion laws. You've been here for so long. And, you know, the fight has been so long and so hard, and, and maybe some of you feel like you really won't see the end of abortion in your lifetime, and maybe all your hard work has been for nothing. And, and I know that some of you feel like maybe you're trying to stop the charging bull of society and their acceptance of abortion with a tiny little red cape, and you're like, it's not working. But maybe that's one reason why I'm here today. I stand here today and I want to encourage you to revive the hope in your hearts that you thought was gone and to let you know that you are not fighting this battle alone. 
I stand here to tell you that there is a generation of radical, on fire for Jesus young people who are willing to take up the baton and run with you until together we see an end to abortion. And I stand here today to tell you that we will see an end to abortion. The tide is shifting, so instead of us being focused on things like the re-election of a very, very pro-abortion president or sometimes the seeming success of Planned Parenthood, which are truly minor things in the greater scheme, I mean, they don't really make a huge deal in the eyes of God, let us keep our eyes fixed on the author and finisher of our faith and remember that we do not fight this battle on our own, praise God. I don't want to be one who is known to have missed the turning tide. No, I want to be one who helps turn that tide. So to all my fellow tide turners here today, let me encourage you and remind you that we know how the book ends. We win. Praise God. So be encouraged, take hope, and, and while it may take a lot of time and it will definitely take a lot of work, we will come out of this, vi this battle victorious. When you're on the side of the God of the universe, I mean, is there any doubt? Where's the room for doubt? Is there any question? And I want to end with, with one incredible song, a quote from a song that was written by Dennis Jernigan, and it's called Mighty Man. And the song says, just because a battle seems never to end, it doesn't mean you're losing, just means you have something to defend. And child, you must remember who you are called to be, a mighty man of valor, no matter what, you have the victory. Take up the stone of faith and put that giant down. Take up the sword of the spirit, take back that stolen ground. And lift your praise to the Father who gives you victory. You are a mighty man of valor, a child of God, victorious, redeemed. Now, one of my other favorite quotes of all time is, all it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. This quote makes one thing extremely, extremely clear, that if we choose to not do anything, that evil will prevail. That is our challenge. But the opposite is also true. If we make a choice to let God use us, if we are willing and we desire to get involved, and if we never ever give up, we will automatically win. So keep fighting in love and truth. Know that there is hope as we release honor. Know that change is coming to both your nation and mine. And I will see you all on the front lines. Thank you very much. Whatever will come our way